everybody, this is Danny Rubin from Marvin, and uh, I want to make this quick lesson for you guys. It's what I would consider, I guess, the best first lesson when you're trying to learn music. And since I've been teaching a lot in the past couple of years, I noticed that the thing that's the most crucial when it comes to learning is the meaning of words. And a lot of times, you know, they, when we redefine the words that we use to describe what we do, we get to go to a new perspective. And that helps practicing and playing. So I want to scale all the way back and propose a really simple question. What is music? Now, I would say that music is sound organized by human beings, right? That's the difference between sound and music. Uh, same way that images aren't paintings, right? Somebody needs to make make the picture for it to be to be. They need to organize the shapes, the colors, whatever. Same thing is you know that's what we do with sound as musicians. We organize um, our materials, our our sonic materials. Now, I would say that the next step is to take this big thing of music and ask yourself well what are the materials that make up music right what are the things that we put in it and how how do they how do they create the balance that we call music so if you take this big idea of what music is and you slice it into pieces i think that the first thing you'd notice is that it slices into three parts and uh most importantly the first part is rhythm Rhythm is anything that has to do with time. Then you have pitch. Anything that has to do with notes, with frequency, right? And the relationship between notes is what we call harmony, right? That's all inside the second subject of what makes music. The third one is timbre, sound color, soft, loud, difference between how different instruments sounds. It's really how you, how you make something sound. So when you go into learning any field, you're armed with logic, and the way you use logic is by asking questions, right? That's like the Socrates thing. You just ask a bunch of questions. Now, in music, you have to think about which questions correlate with which one of those three parts that make up music. And the first and most important question with music is when and where, right? That's rhythm. So where does something go is the question for the composer that works with a piece of paper and what he writes really is the architecture of music it's not in time it's not being performed a jazz musician an improviser a performer of classical music asks himself when when do i put things in the music but since you can go back and forward when you're composing when you're writing music you're asking you're asking yourself where in the music it sits so you see, those two questions are what make up rhythm. Pitch and harmony is the question of what, right? What you put in the music, wherever you put it. So as an organizer of music, you're given a choice of where to put things or when to put things if you're actually playing. And then you ask yourself the question, well, what would sound good? What would be the appropriate note, frequency that goes into a particular moment? right and then the third question timbre is how how does whatever i put in the music whenever i put it sound so if you think about it just like playing a jazz song you know or a, or a rock song or a solo or whatever you're putting notes in time wherever you put them belongs to the realm of rhythmic language you have to have a perception and a system to know where you are in the music right and Western music is notation. Indian music, you have solkatu. You're, you have an awareness of beats, of subdivisions. And you have to somehow start to see the grid. You know, the, how, how, like, you know, have names for, you know, whatever the subdivision is. The eighth notes, the quarter notes. Recognize where the pulse is. Recognize what a measure in the music is. That gives you your footing and lets you know the actual architecture of when things happen in music. Right? But once you have an awareness of that, you can ask yourself, well, what do I put in wherever I put it? And then how I make it sound? How do I make it sing? That's a question 
of timbre. You would call that maybe like technique or something that's instrument specific. Do I use vibrato to bring that part to life? Do I play it softer, louder? Um, there are other questions like which, you know, which is like the question of a composer too, like which instrument should I use? But in a jazz combo, you know, you know what instruments you're playing. You know, you usually have four guys, they're all playing their own instruments. So, you know, that that's that's a thing too. So that's kind of a way of thinking that I think is very helpful when you're starting to practice because, you know, practicing is problem solving. And you got to define your problems by asking yourself, well, do I, am I asking myself what to play over what, which is a question of harmony, what pitch goes with what pitch or what note goes with what chord, or how does Stevie Ray Vaughan make that pentatonic scale sound so alive, right? How, how does Jeff Beck make it sound like it's singing? That's a question of timbre. Or, you know, when does Charlie Parker put all his notes, you know, how is he subdividing and how is he choosing where and when to put the notes, which is the most pressing issue. Now, another point I want to bring up is the idea of our musical inheritance and what I really want to think about, I think about it like chaos versus order in music. So a lot of people nowadays have kind of, uh, are questioning the things which belong to the realm of order, right? You, I'll give you an example. Let's say if you're listening to this video, you were born at a time where they already had electric guitars and amps. You inherited a lot. But even the guitar itself is a product of our culture and of our technology, right? The, the frets divide the octave into 12 even pieces. If you look at the way you know more ancient instruments were tuned, uh, they got their pitches using the, the overtone series, which isn't an equal division of 12 pieces of an octave. But who says it needs to be 12, right? It could be 13. If you were to put 13 frets, equally dividing the octave, you would have a pretty horrendous sounding instrument, but you would have gone outside the realm of order into the realm of chaos and extracted something new, right? What I do, I'm not, I'm not an innovator in that way. Marvin doesn't innovate in that way at all. We actually accept our inheritance. If anything, we fuse different systems, right? I, I really subscribe to the Indian way of thinking about rhythm, but the Western way of thinking about harmony and pitch, and maybe the jazz way, the American way of, you know, thinking about, you know, grooving and how to solo and improvising. But it's kind of like a melding of existing cultures. And since I was born at an age when I was absorbing, you know, a lot of things from different places in the world, I tried to make sense of them. But there are two types of people. There are the kind of people who try to change things and the kind of people who try to know things. And I think, you know, I'm trying to always learn because I always think I'm very ignorant about every, anything I don't know. That's like the definition of, you know, ignorance. You're ignorant until you're not. So if you go and study what happened before you, you will eventually get to a place where the things you do are new things because you develop an awareness of what's been done with the system you inherit. But nobody says that that's the only system, but I suspect that human aesthetics moves much slower than arbitrary rules, right? So for example, if we go back to dividing the guitar with 13 frets between the distance of where the zero fret and the 12th fret is, the octave into 13 parts, yeah, it will all be brand new stuff that would sound horrendous, right? If you start, if you write music using uh, septuplets as the only subdivision, or like let's say a division of 13 notes per beat, and you know, do try to innovate like that with arbitrary mathematics that don't rely on human aesthetics, as if you're trying to make up your own system from scratch, you will inev inevitably do a bunch of shit that sounds pretty weird. People really have tried to do it after like the Second World War in classical music, right? John Cage, you know, Leigh Schoenberg, all this, you know, Stockhausen, people like that. What, what were they doing? They were saying that the system of Western harmony and rhythm has been beaten to death and exhausted by keep people composing and composing and composing and we need new tools to make new things. To me, the only problem with that is when you're trying to make a new system that doesn't rely on human aesthetics, you pay a price 
by the way it sounds, right? Like, you know, we, we don't perceive it to be very pretty. And um, that's a price that you, you know, that some people are willing to pay and some people are not. But anyways, in terms of your practice, I encourage just learning what's been done and, you know, really spending a lot of time with the great music of the past, not so much transcribing, but trying to really understand what people have been doing. Um, the other thing about it is, you know, don't lock yourself in a room with a guitar and create a vacuum around yourself where you imagine you're making new things, right? You can make new songs, but to think that you can inherit this instrument that has a system of pitch already worked into the tuning that evolved over hundreds of years, right? And a way of tuning the guitar and every, you know everything kind of made for you and then you're gonna somehow create a, new, a brand new language from mixing those 12 pitches and you know your intuitive understanding of rhythm that's the biggest form of like hubris like that there is right that's that's saying that like well fuck everything that happened before me those people were stupid and they didn't lock themselves in my bedroom like as long as i'm willing to but it's like no it's like there have been enormous tal enormously talented people that have picked up and looked at the same instrument you're looking at and they you know did amazing things with it and you should check out a lot of their amazing things and incorporate them so anyway that's just my two cents see you at a marvin show and i hope it helps bye bye